Uh, well, welcome everybody. I'm sorry I missed you last time. I was in Lesbos, and uh, but uh, we certainly had a good pray for you when we were in Lesbos very early in the morning because they're two hours ahead of us. So we were really uh, we were probably praying at five o'clock UK time when you when it was seven here. Uh, so um, we're excited to be here in the second of this on the in the series of spiritual warfare. And the previous one is on the website. And if you haven't seen it, it may be worth you having a look at it as we go, because it was sort of the foundation for this series. You don't need to have heard it for today, but it is useful to actually have seen it if you feel you've got time to do that. Can I just tell you, if anybody does not get our burning issues, this is actually not the last one. Uh, the other one was about the fear of the Lord. But um, if you do not get burning issues and you would like it, you need to send Karen your address. It's a, I believe it's a great magazine and it tells you all about what Flame does. So may I just encourage you um, to, to, to actually um, get a copy and Karen will send it to you or will arrange it to be sent to you if you send us your address, but we won't send it otherwise, of course. Um, you know, you know, Flame is a ministry that considers itself a ministry which prepares Christians for the end times. That's what we, I believe that's what we do when we're on mission, when we're on the forge and also on the far side. Um, so I just, I, I, you know, the, the, the issues that we're covering are to help us to fight the battle that we as Christians, A, are in now, but could be, um, in great in to a greater degree uh, in the future uh, and so uh, it, that's why we're running this particular series as well and we will do that in November and December as well so may I pray and then I'm just going to hand over to Val who's coming to give the devotion this morning so Lord Jesus I thank you for the 80 plus people that are on here now. And Lord Jesus, we pray for those that have not uh, got in, we pray that you'd help them to connect, to remember uh, if you want them here. So Father, we pray for those not on, and we just ask Lord that you would help them to get on. For those of us that are here, we pray you cover us with the blood of Jesus. We pray for Val to be anointed um, and to speak spirit to spirit to us this morning. And we just ask for the anointing of the Holy Spirit in all of our rooms in Jesus and wherever we are, whether we're in a conservatory or in a study or a lounge or even sitting outside or in a car. Father, I pray uh, the anointing of the Holy Spirit wherever we are in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Over to you, Val. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Morning, everyone. Um, as Christians, we're called to a lifetime of prayer, and we take our example from Jesus, whose priority in life was prayer. Talking to the Father took priority over physical rest, physical appetite, and his social activity. And every major event and every minor decision in Jesus's life was shrouded with prayer. And if we are serious about being Christ-like, we must follow his example. Jesus did not pray because he had to. He prayed because he wanted to be obedient, to be united with and empowered by the Father. And obedience to our Father is a will choice, willingly taken out of love. We want to please our Father out of our love for him. And our desire is always to be united with the Father to be in right relationship with him so that we stand under his covering, his protection, his guidance and his blessing. And we need the empowerment from our Father in order for us to live and grow in our faith and in our ministry. Scripture tells us to pray without ceasing. And Matthew 26 says, keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. And in Ephesians 6, reminds us that part of our arsenal of weapons of warfare is to pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers 
and requests. Prayer is that unique channel of dialogue between us and the Lord, and it draws us into intimacy as the Bride of Christ. The result will be knowing his will and making known his will to others. Moses was a perfect example of this. Moses knew God, therefore God made known his ways to Moses. And we read in Exodus 33 how the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, just as a man speaks to his friend. And the Lord longs to speak to each one of us today through the Holy Spirit, just as he spoke to Moses. Not only does God want to speak to us, but he also wants to show us a dimension of life that is invisible to the natural eye. The Bible says that God is spirit. Therefore, to know and understand the things of God, our spiritual eyes need to be opened. We can ask the Lord to reveal spiritual reality to us, just as Elisha did when he asked God to open his servant's eyes, allowing him to see the chariots of protection in, in 2 Kings uh, chapter 6. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army of horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes and let him see. And the Lord opened the young man's eyes. And when he looked up, he saw the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. <clears throat> the more our spiritual eyes are opened, the more understanding we will have about our physical circumstances. Jesus was so spiritually attuned that he said in Luke chapter 8, when the woman with the issue of blood touched him, Who is the one who touched me? And Peter said, The ma master, the multitudes are crowding and pressing upon you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I was aware that the power had gone out of me. Peter was looking at the natural touch. Jesus was aware that something was happening in the spiritual realm. Prayer is powerful and brings into being that which God has already ordained will happen. In Matthew 18, it speaks of binding and loosing. What is bound on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose in earth will be loosed in heaven. The power of prayer lies not in how much we pray, but in how much our prayers are in accordance with the principles of prayer. Watchman Nee says that we labour together with God in prayer, prepare the way for his will and pray with all prayer and supplication to grant him the manoeuvrability to so work. Many are the things which God wills to do and would like to do, but his hands are bound because his children do not sympathise with him and have not prayed so as to prepare ways for him. Hence, our most important work is to prepare the way of the Lord. With God, there are many possibilities, but these will turn into impossibilities if believers do not open up ways for him. Part of our prayer armoury is prophetic action or declaration. And it's a well-known principle and practice in intercession that the ground must be prepared ahead of any mission by soaking it in prayer. And Dutch Sheets endorses the same principle of prayer as Watchman Nee. Prophetic actions and declarations prepare the way for God to work upon earth. In a sense, they release God to do something as they become the implemented means through which God has chosen to work. Obedience to God brings a response from God. Prophetic actions and declarations mean nothing if they're not directed by God. And when God gives instruction, it must be obeyed. Faith releases God. When he says, do this, Faith and obedience release him, and God's creative, effectual word is then released upon the earth with all the power and energy and ability that come forth through prophetic declaration. 
prophetic action or declaration is something said or done in the natural realm at the direction of God that prepares the way for him to move in the spiritual realm, which then affects change in the natural realm. An example of this is when Moses was told by God to stretch out his rod over the Red Sea. God wanted the symbolic rod of authority to be stretched over the Red Sea. If Moses was not obedient and the rod was not stretched out, there would not have been a rolling back of the sea. Another example is when Moses was told to hold up the rod of authority over the battle Israel was having with the Amalek. And when he held it up, Israel prevailed. But when he let it down because of fatigue, the Amalek prevailed. Something was happening in the spiritual realm that brought about by prophetic action on earth. Under the power of anointing, what we do in prayer on earth releases action in the spiritual realm. The word of God is never ineffective. It will always produce. The, world is, the word is called a seed in scriptures. And when we sow God's seed, we are sowing his word and God brings forth life by which we are born again. God's word brings cleansing, maturing, freedom, healing, as well as many other things. When God speaks his word, he sprinkles his seed that will bring forth. And when we speak God's word into situations as the Holy Spirit directs, we are sprinkling the seeds of God, which then gives him the ability to cause life to come forth. Remember Ezekiel, who when asked by God to look at the dry bones of his nation and ask the question, son of man, can these dry bones live? Ezekiel said, O oh, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then God said, prophesy to these dead bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. As we unite ourselves with God through the Holy Spirit in prayer, God can change our nation, our ministry, our situation. Our prayers open the way for God to work the miracles. Let's do it. Let's let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Let's fill our back with stones of victory and run to meet Goliath. Let's demonstrate the awesomeness of our God. Let's grow. Let's roar. Let's let Jesus live through us. And let's pray. Amen. Amen, Amen, Carl. Thank you. Yes. Um, yes. I mean, that's part. This is the spiritual battle to be praying. So thank you so much. And now I'm I'm going to invite Major General, uh, retired Roddy Porter, to come and speak to us on spiritual warfare. Roddy is the chief executive of Military Ministries International. Um, we um, share, not share offices, but we're in the same office uh, block together. We work closely together. I used to be a trustee for 12 years for Military Ministries International. So there's a lot of overlap between what we do. And I just want to welcome him here this morning. I think this is your first time to speak on the fireside, Roddy. And we're so grateful. And um, if it's all right, I'd quite like to pray for you as you start and we just ask the Lord, Roddy, just to come and anoint you for, the, anoint the words that you bring this morning. Lord Jesus, we, although we would quite like a blessing, I'm much more interested in being changed. Lord Jesus, and I pray that as Roddy speaks, there would be life-changing words of the word of God coming to speak into our spirits in the name of Jesus. And Lord Jesus, we, if if we change, we will be blessed. But Lord, the important thing is for life changing words. And Lord, you're the one that will bring that anointing. You're the one that will bring that change. And Lord, we recognize the battle that we're in. And if we don't, then we need to wake up 
to the fact that if we're being effective for the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be in a battle. And Father, today I pray that you would um, equip us for the battle ahead through your servant, Roddy, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Welcome. Welcome, Roddy. Thanks very much, Jan. And uh, that's, a, that's a lovely welcome. Thank you for your prayer. Um, and Val, thank you very much indeed for that uh, wonderful devotional, which was uh, inspiring and challenging, um, and I'm just really grateful for it. Um, good morning, fellow warriors. Good morning, soldiers of Christ. Uh, it's lovely to be with you. Before I start, I just thought I would um, trail um, two books. I'd just like to endorse Jan's recommendation um, last time she spoke about the book uh, Spiritual Warfare for the End Times by Derek Prince, which I'm thoroughly enjoying at the minute. Excellent book. I do recommend that. The second book I'd like to recommend is by Peter Jones, who uh, runs Alpha for Prisons. Lovely, lovely man of God. And his latest book is called King of the Castle. And it's subtitled Ways Out for Christian Men with Addictions. It's an excellent read. It's only about 80 or 90 pages long, and it's really, really helpful. So two books there, um, which I'd like to flag up right at the start. Spiritual Warfare, Breakthrough for Life and Ministry. I read that, not surprisingly, as being a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Um, how effective soldiering with and for Christ gives us breakthrough in our lives. And Paul um, encourages Timothy, doesn't he, in 2 Timothy 2, 3 and 4, share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Um, and the parallel, the spiritual parallel is really obvious there. This is important that we know who our commanding officer is. We understand the nature of the battle we are in. We understand the army we are part of, and we recognize the forces of the enemy and how they operate. It's vital that we know our weapons, both our defensive and our offensive weapons. What are they? How do we use them? Because as Jan has said, and as Val has said in her devotional, we are in a battle, a spiritual battle, whether we care to admit it or not. The majority of this world are not aware of the spiritual battle that rages for their souls as the enemy continues to keep them blinded to the gospel, 2 Corinthians 4.4. And as soon as we give our lives to Jesus Christ, we are in a battle. And if we want to accomplish things for the Lord, we will need to fight for them because the enemy, Satan, is determined to stop us. But the good news is that greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world, 1 John 4.4. 4. Now, just as there is no state of non-worship, just as there is no state of non-worship, we all worship someone or something, and if it is not the Lord Jesus Christ, it is some created thing or person, so there is no state of non-combat. There are no non-combatants in this tussle of good and evil. The armies of the Lord against the rulers, authorities and cosmic powers over this present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, Ephesians 6, 12. We are in a battle for life in all its fullness and for vibrant, effective ministry. Don't we want to take ground for Jesus? Yes, we do. We want to push back the enemy and his grip on people's lives and see the rule and reign of Jesus Christ extended until the day he comes again. And so we fight. At its most basic, spiritual warfare is what we do every day to overcome as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God has provided us the tools to do so. I remember very well back in the early 80s, when I was at university as a, an, a, a military student, um, going to a meeting with that wonderful prophet of God, Alec Buchanan, um, who many of you, of, of whom many, uh, of whom many of you might have heard, and we were expecting a really good um, Bible talk, and indeed we got one, but we got much more than we expected because he came with a prophetic picture, and that prophetic picture 
was of the Lord Jesus Christ walking amongst us as we sat in that uh, room. And in this picture, we were standing to attention in front of our commander in chief as he walked around the ranks inspecting us. And our commander in chief was not pleased as he saw breastplates that were ill fitting, as he saw helmets that were damaged with no chin straps, as he saw shields that were broken, as he saw swords that were rusty and not sharpened. And Alec brought us a very stern word from the Lord that there were many in the room who were not prepared for the battle, who were not looking after their equipment, and therefore were in danger of being sidelined, isolated, and destroyed by the enemy. And that uh, prophetic picture which he bought really stirred our hearts, I, ha I have to say. And there was a lot of repentant prayer and prayer ministry uh, as a result of that uh, talk. And I, for one, went up for prayer ministry to get right in some areas of my life with the Lord. Because these armor, these elements of our armor are vital. Um, and Ephesians 6 clearly lays out some of, of that armory, the belt of truth, knowing the truth, walking in the truth. Jesus is truth. Satan is a liar. It's having truth in the innermost being, Psalm 51 verse 6. In the army, the belt holds all your equipment together. If your belt isn't tight or it breaks, everything falls off. Your kit can't stay on unless the belt is well fitting and applied. And this is the same with the belt of truth. It is fundamental uh, to the way we walk through life. The breastplate of righteousness, Christ's righteousness, not our own. His righteousness guards our heart. In Northern Ireland, we wore flak jackets, uh, which stops bottles and stones, but covering the heart and the, and the lungs on the back and the front were pieces of bulletproof glass, which could stop a sniper's bullet. And that's the point of a flak jacket. And that is the point of the breastplate of righteousness. We take on Christ's righteousness as a garment and it guards our heart. We take up the shield of faith. Now the Romans used the shield in conjunction with the sword to parry a blow of the enemy, to knock him off guard and then to stab him. They also used, used the shield to crush an enemy's foot or to break his nose or knock him out. And the spiritual parallels here are fairly obvious, I think. In Northern Ireland, we had three foot and six foot shields and they were designed to protect the whole body. Uh, basically from petrol bombs and acid bombs and rocks and things like that. And shields are most effectively used in concert with others, interlocked shields covering each other, working as a team and using our shields as much to protect each other as to protect ourselves. Because there is a great danger, there was a great danger in the Roman world, but there was a great danger in our spiritual fight of isolation, of gaps in a shield wall. 1 Peter 5 8 tells us that Satan roams around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. If you are isolated, if you are not in fellowship, uh, then you are in danger um, of being so devoured. And so a shield wall is most effective when shields are interlocked and we are sharing faith. We are encouraging each other in faith. We are provoking each other to faith. The helmet of salvation, it covers the head. It gives us confidence in what Christ has done. It brings purity in our thought life, knowing that we are his. Uh, the Northern Ireland helmet was very effective in this respect. It stopped quite a few blows from rocks and stones and things like that. Any one of which would have taken us out of the fight. So the helmet of salvation is utterly vital. And the shoes, we sometimes gloss over the shoes, the preparation of the gospel of, pay, of peace. Look at the underside of Roman soldiers' sandals, studded with heavy iron studs. This was to avoid slipping. As soon as a battlefield started, a battle started, uh, the field would become very slippery with mud churned up <clears throat> and also with blood. And if you slipped, not only, not only were you vulnerable to being killed, 
uh, your colleagues were vulnerable to being taken out as you created a hole in the wall. And in Northern Ireland, our boots uh, were so designed to avoid slipping in oil and things like that, so we could stand. And as Ephesians 6 says, having done all things, to stand, to be still standing at the end of the battle. And that standing is also to withstand, to defend and to attack with sure footedness. And then the sword of the spirit. I'm going to say a bit more about the sword of the spirit, the word of God later. So I pass over it for now. And as Val mentioned, we sometimes gloss over the vital importance of prayer as a key weapon in our spiritual armory. Of course, it's not, it wasn't a weapon in the Roman soldier's armory. Um, uh, not that he deployed into the field with, but for us, it is vital, as, as Val has mentioned. Now, is there such a thing as the law of warfare? I believe there is. And we find it in Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 1 to 4. And it says this, when you go out to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and an army larger than your own, you shall not be afraid of them, for the Lord your God is with you who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And when you draw near to battle, the priest shall come forward and speak to the people and shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, today you are drawing near for battle against your enemies. Let not your heart faint. Do not fear or panic or be in dread of them, for the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies, to give you the victory. I'll say that last sentence again. Do not fear or panic or be in dread of them, for the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies, to give you the victory. And I believe that throughout the Bible, this is the fundamental law of warfare. When I was a young lieutenant, uh, I was in, uh, I was training in Canada, Battus, the British Army Training Unit, Suffield, which is 100 square miles of rolling plain land. It was just after I'd come back to the Lord or the Lord had brought me back to himself after two years of fairly horrible backsliding. And we had a downtime on our big armoured exercise. And I was sitting in the shade of my armoured vehicle reading a Christian book uh, and um, with my Bible open. And the Lord showed me a picture about this spiritual battle. And it stuck with me ever since. In... Uh, on this training area, it's so vast and so difficult to map read that you could waste a lot of time trying to orientate yourself to the target you were meant to be attacking. So to make it a little bit easier, the range staff would set up a can um, on the centre of the objective, and, and they would put in the middle of this can a pole, very often with a crossbar, so that you could see where the objective was and orientate yourself towards it. And as I sat it beside my armoured vehicle and meditated on this particular picture, God said, this is what your life is like. This is what the spiritual battle is like. You have to take objectives. You have to cross ground. You have to engage with the enemy. You have to fight through. But as you do that, make sure you know and remember that there is a cross already on the objective that you are seeking to take. The Lord Jesus has already done it. He has won the victory for us on the cross and through his death and the shedding of his blood and his resurrection, he has made all things possible. So although you have to fight, know that the Lord has gone before you to prepare the way for victory. And this is such an important uh, principle that we understand as we conduct warfare. And we see it most obviously um, in the Old Testament, in the experience of King Jehoshaphat, 2 Chronicles 20. It's well worth meditating on that particular period of um, the history of Israel and how Jehoshaphat went about um, uh, fighting um, the enemies that came against him, the Moabites, the Ammonites and the Mirnites. Uh, and that, that famous uh, bit of, um, of the word, uh, that was that was said by um, um, Jehaziel, for the battle is not yours, but God's. You will not need to fight in this battle. Stand firm, hold your position and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed, 
to not tomorrow go out against them and the Lord will be with you. It is the Lord's battle. If we look at scripture, the scheme of manoeuvre, the timing and the ground for fighting is invariably of the Lord's choosing. We could never have con uh, conceived of a battle plan to take Jericho or to take Ai or the Battle of the Five Kings or the Southern Conquests. And everywhere we read in these battles that the Lord gave, whoever it was, into their hands. We could not humanly have conceived of the battles that Deborah and Barak fought, of Gideon's 300, of Jehos Jehoshaphat's campaigns and the campaigns of David. These uh, were de designs for battle of the Lord's making. And I think that's an, a really important thing to remember as we go forward fighting, that we need to understand what the Lord's design for battle is and seek him in prayer to understand not only what he is calling us to do, but how he wants us to do it. So how do we prepare to fight? I think it, in very practical terms and very basic terms, it starts with submitting and hearing. And I think wonderful examples of that are Moses at the burning bush in Exodus 3, um, read the whole chapter, where God manifests himself to Moses. Moses is 80 and he's about to start his mission. And despite the fact that Moses is a murderer uh, who is now living in Midian, God sees his heart and God knows his heart. And God knows that he can use Moses because his heart is willing. And as that chapter expands, he's willing to submit to God's will and purpose. Joshua is in a very similar situation before the Battle of Jericho. In Joshua 5, 13 to 15, he has that encounter with the commander of the Lord's army. And I believe that that encounter is actually with the Lord Jesus Christ himself before the Battle of Jericho. And of course, Joshua wants to know, are you coming to fight on our side or theirs? And he says, neither. But as the commander of the Lord's host, I have come. Take off your shoes because you are on holy ground. And I think that in terms of our commission to fight and our ongoing fighting, we need to bear with that example of being on holy ground before the Lord on a regular basis. Not only were Moses and Joshua commissioned in this way through an encounter with the Lord, but they continued throughout their mission, throughout the days of their service, to maintain a close and holy relationship on holy ground with their sandals off, figuratively speaking, before the Lord, in submission, in alignment with God's purpose. And I believe this is the key biblical principle for effective warfare. Submission to God and resistance of Satan, in line with James 4, 7 and 1 Peter 5, 6 to 8. Submission to God and resistance of the enemy is the fundamental biblical principle for effective warfare. So is our heart right? Is our will in, in submission to the Lord? So how do we fight then with God's authority? I'd like to look at a case study. And the one that came to me as I was preparing for this is Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. And you'll know very well that Caleb was amongst the 12 spies sent into the promised land by Moses in Numbers 13. And these spies wrecked the land. And without except, well, with the exception of Caleb and Joshua, came back and reported that the people of the land were too powerful for them and produced a discouraging report. So much so that in chapter 14 of Numbers, the people actually rebel, saying that they should choose another leader instead of Moses and go back to Egypt. And we know about the disaster that overtook that generation of Israelites as a result of that rebellion. But Caleb is cut from a different cloth. For Caleb, God's promise was enough, irrespective of the strength and quality of the opposition. In Numbers chapter 14, verses 6 to 9, we read, And Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, 
who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes and said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, the land which we passed through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their protection is removed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Well, where have we heard that before? It's in that glorious passage in Colossians 2 about being alive in Christ. Colossians 2.13 says, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. Hallelujah. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Praise God. Just as by faith Joshua and Caleb declared that God had rendered the inhabitant armies of the promised land unprotected, ripe for conquest, so Jesus Christ has disarmed the rulers and authorities that the devil commands, putting them to open shame, triumphing over them on the cross. These are the same rulers and authorities, the rulers, the authorities, the cosmic powers over this present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, against whom we fight, according to Ephesians 6.12. We know that the devil and the powers and principalities under his command are powerful, and will be until, and will be, until finally defeated by the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes again. But in Christ, they have been already disarmed. They are no match for him. And we have Christ's authority. And he invites us to continue to take ground from Satan from our position in Christ. Colossians 1, 13 to 14 says he's delivered us from the domain of darkness and transformed, uh, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We can fight against Satan and his activities because of the efficacy of Jesus's shed blood on the cross, of his death and resurrection, and the resultant fact that God has transferred us from Satan's domain of darkness into Jesus's kingdom. We are citizens of Christ's kingdom. We are not of this world or of Satan's domain any longer. We are soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ, not conscripts in the hordes of hell. It is vital to understand and believe this life and ministry transforming fact. We are citizens of God's kingdom. Not only that, but we have inherited through Christ his divine nature. 2 Peter 1 verses 3 and 4 is the most stunning scripture I have encountered in recent days. Listen to this. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. What? This is so good, it's almost too much to take in. We have been granted, which is a legal or contractual term, everything we need for life and godliness through knowing Jesus. Everything we need is ours in him. Now, today. This is a breakthrough verse, I believe, for us. 2 Peter 1, 3 to 4. Not only that, Jesus has granted us his precious and very great promises. Now, today, these promises are in God's word and they're there for us to benefit from. 
But do we know what these promises are? And through these promises, we become partakers of his own divine nature. Now, today, and increasingly as Jesus completes the good work he started in us when he saved us. Friends, we're not only citizens of Jesus's kingdom, we are partakers of his nature. We are now like him spiritually, as well as being created in his image. As such, we are invited to engage in what he is doing and he authorize, authorizes us to fight. He com commissions us in many scriptures, but here are two. First one is Luke 10, 17 to 20. You'll remember it well. The 72 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And the second scripture I would highlight is Matthew 28, 18, again, even better known to us. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We have been given Christ's authority to go in his name and achieve victory over the kingdom of darkness using all the weapons that the Lord has given us, which are not of this flesh, not of the flesh, but which have divine power to destroy strongholds, 2 Corinthians 10, 4. But we can only use these weapons and exercise our authority from our position with and in Christ. So we do need to check, is our life hidden with Christ in God? Colossians 3.3. 3. Do you know that you are blessed in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places? Ephesians 1.3. Having believed the gospel, do you know that you are sealed with the Holy Spirit? Ephesians 1.13. Are you living as if you are raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus? Ephesians 2.18. These are some of his precious and very great promises. Um, that are unpacked in that earlier verse in uh, in, in, in John, uh, the big pardon, in 2 Peter, some of his very great and precious promises. And these are ours as part of our spiritual inheritance. Well, back to Caleb. He was an effective warrior of the Lord because he was holy for the Lord. The scripture says this on several occasions. He saw what God was doing, believed what he said to Moses and followed the vision, which was entry into the promised land. He wasn't daunted by obstacles. He un understood the reality of the Israelites position in God. The enemy was already defeated in the spiritual realm by the Lord, and they should go in to make it a reality in their experience. And this is very much uh, along the lines that Val was saying in her devotional about prayer. We fight the battle in the heavenlies. The victory is won in the spiritual realm. And then we can move forward to declare and see that victory in the reality of our experience. God said in Numbers 14 that Caleb had a different spirit to that of his countrymen. And in that spirit, which is the, the spirit of God, he fought expectant of victory. Caleb was determined to fulfill what the Lord had promised to Israel and to him. And belief in God's promise to him overcame any vestige of physical weakness, particularly his age, uh, because he was 85 uh, when he said in Joshua 14, 11, I am still as strong today as I was in the day that Moses sent me. 45 years before. My strength now is as my strength was then. Listen to this. 
My strength now is as my strength was then for war and for going and coming. So in the Lord, he was able to achieve great things, even though he was 85. Now, most of us on this screen are north of 50, praise God. Uh, and so we have no excuse but to keep going. Uh, and what a joy it is that we, our strength can be renewed uh, as we stand for the Lord and as we allow his Holy Spirit and his word to uh, infuse us and to wash over us and to fill us. We too can say with Caleb, I am still as strong today I, as I was in the day that God called me. My strength now is as my strength was then for war and for going and coming. And as a result of his faith and his passion and his determination to follow the Lord, he inherited. Um, and that inheritance was confirmed by both Moses and by God personally uh, in, in the scriptures. And Caleb, I think, is a great soldier uh, to model ourselves on, to model our behaviours as warriors on and well worth meditating about. Now, very briefly, coming to an end, um, learning to fight is important. Now, there are some on this uh, meeting who are very experienced spiritual warriors and have known the Lord for a long time and are used to fighting the battle. But maybe there are some for whom this is the first taste of spiritual warfare. Well, I say to everybody, and particularly to me, who, who, and I certainly have got my L plates on, I can tell you, that we need to train and we need to learn. We will never know enough and we will never, ever know it all. We need to train as soldiers train in the use of their weapons, their tactics, how to work and operate in a formation, be that a mission like flame or MMI or a church, especially when acting as part of a team, in fact. And so as spiritual warriors, we need to exercise with our spiritual weapons. And first of all, the word of God, the sword of the spirit, which I said I would come back to. It is the word of God primarily that we use to dismantle Satan's strategies. Following Jesus' example in Luke 4, learning to say with the Holy Spirit authority, it is written, dot, 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 whatever is written in the word of God. C.H. Spurgeon said, and I quote, we are to pray always and watch constantly. The one note that rings out from Ephesians chapter 6 is this, take the sword, take the sword. No longer is it talk and debate. No longer is it parley and compromise. The word of thunder is, take the sword. The captain's voice is clear as a trumpet. Take the sword. No Christian man here, and he means Christian man and woman, no Christian man and woman here will have been obedient to our text unless with clear, sharp and decisive firmness, courage and resolve, he and she takes the sword. We must go to heaven sword in hand all the way. Take the sword. End of quote. What a wonderful quote that is. The sword is the one offensive weapon in the armour of Ephesians 6. Where is your sword? Where is the word of God in your life? I recall uh, vaguely an, an American speaker saying that uh, the average American household has two Bibles, neither of which are read. Can you find your sword? Is it razor sharp and comfortable in your hand after hours of practice? Or is it dull and blunt, rusted into its scabbard or carelessly tossed aside? The sword of the spirit does terrible damage to the enemy. And we are commanded to employ the sword, the word of God, to do terrible damage to the enemy. But how can we? We don't know what it says or have never used the words in it to fight with. Nowadays, when I read the word, I revel in it, but I'm also chastened by, by how poorly I know it. May we repent of the passing reference we pay to the word of life. 
may we be determined to really mine the word, understanding it and applying it in the power of the Holy Spirit. So coming into the land, the word of truth, the sword of the spirit, utterly vital, walking always in truth, speaking the truth without fear or favour, but with sincerity and with gentleness. Satan is a liar and the father of lies, John 8, 44. How then can God's people lie? We must always trade in the truth. Praying in faith in the Holy Spirit, acting and praying in the name of Jesus, employing always the full armour of God, worshipping, fasting with prayer, living with 1 Corinthians 13 love, some of the weapons at our disposal for fighting this battle. It's an ongoing process. When David came to Saul to declare that he was going to be the one to take on Goliath, uh, Goliath in 1 Samuel 17, uh, verses 32 to 37, when Saul questions uh, David's ability and capacity to uh, destroy Goliath, David said, I fought the lion and the bear. When one of them came and took one of my lambs, I went and encountered it and killed it. And he says, this Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. We need to learn to kill the lion and the bear before we kill Goliath. And it is a process. It is a process, uh, but we can start with the lion and the bear. And most importantly, find a teacher. Get yourself accountable and under the authority of a mature believer who know, knows how to move in spiritual warfare. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Find a Christian brother or sister who you can imitate in the Lord. And imitate the heroes of the Bible. Be like Caleb, Joshua, Jehoshaphat. They were outstanding warriors for the Lord. And their example commends our observation and our imitate, imitation. And above all, imitate Christ by drawing close to him and walking alongside him. So let's understand the battle we're in. Know our commander. Recognize the schemes of the enemy. Keep our armor in good order and use it. Join in this spiritual battle for the kingdom. Train to be a good soldier of Christ and see the breakthrough come in your life and ministry. Shall we pray together? Lord, we thank you so much for who you are. Lord, we come back to you as it were on holy ground with our shoes off and we desire to submit to you our lord and our savior our fount of life and power and knowledge we lay our lives down before you lord this morning and we declare to you afresh that we are soldiers in your army and lord we long to be obedient to you and to be responsive to your call we want to learn how to use the weapons you have given us with greater capacity and greater authority as you teach us, as you grow your presence in us, as we take on more and more of your divine nature, as you, Jesus, complete the work you began in us until your day. So, Lord, we want to learn to fight this fight. And, Lord, we want to take ground for you. We want to be obedient to your call. So, Lord, we ask that you would help us train, that you would train us. Would you highlight, Lord, areas of our lives that are displeasing to you or which inhibit us fighting the battle? And would you make us more like yourself, Lord, and help us together as your people to march effectively in lockstep with you as we seek to do your business? And as we seek to see your kingdom develop and grow on this earth, may you be glorified. May the enemy be thrown down. And may your love and your power and your worth spread out throughout this earth. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Roddy. And can we give praise to the Lord for this? We thank God for Roddy, but we want to praise the Lord. So could we just give the Lord a clap? This is not for you, Roddy. This is for the Lord. And it's like warfare for the Lord. We're praising him. We lift the name of Jesus on high. And we thank you that we're in the battle. We thank you that you're equipping us. We thank you that you're teaching us. Jesus, we give glory to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus. <laughs> thank you. Um, we are going to go into breakout rooms now. Roddy will not be in a breakout room. There will be facilitators in each breakout room because some of you have not been on with us before. If you have any questions for Roddy, please give them to your facilitator or even put them in the chat box. But better, uh, and we'll, there are 11 groups. We will not get through 11 questions at the end because we like to finish by 11.45, but we will do what we can. So if you have a question for Roddy, one question per group to come to Roddy and we will finish after in, uh, 10 minutes in, in the breakout rooms, uh, in case you've got uh, it, it, rather long questions to be answered. So thank you and may you be blessed in your breakout rooms in Jesus name. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I hope you've all had a good time. Mm. And um, it's good to see Eddie here, well done. Uh, yeah, can I ask, um, I'm just looking for the, Val. Have you got any questions from your group for for Roddy? Val Batchelor? Um, no, no. Uh, we had some really lovely uh, discussions and some helpful um, comments, but uh, nothing specific for Roddy. Okay, Linda, have you got any questions? No. Okay. Um, uh, yes, Sandy, you've got one. Thank you. Yes, um, we found. Um, that the interlocking of shields um, was very um, uh, profound in a way in that you're working as a group and um, keeping the enemy at bay. And we, we felt that this was um, quite uh, interesting. We probably do it for ourselves, but as a group, do we? Is that a question, Sandy? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Right. We got that, Roddy. Yeah, I have. <clears throat> um, I think, um, yeah, um, there's no doubt. Um, I mean, if you, uh, um, if you look at, um, if you look at how uh, Roman warfare was done, it was fundamentally important to retain the integrity of the shield wall. And yeah. that was, that was, um, that was how armies won and lost, basically, in those days. And so there is a there is a principle one can uh, apply to collective um, encouragement. Now we're talking about the shield of faith, so we're talking about sharing, sharing faith. There's something there's power in our testimony, which encourages each other to greater faith, and there's power in sharing faith and exercising faith with each other, and um, provoking each other to to good works um, <clears throat> through our through our faith. Um, experience uh, Hebrews 10 24 provoking each other to good works um, is a good way of stirring up yeah. faith in each other and I think this is important um, you know we we do tend to think of wearing and using the armor of God on a personal level and of course that's right uh, and we should do and we should learn to use the, the, the armor we've been given for ourselves it is there as self-defense but there is a collective element to it, <clears throat> because if we're all using the armor of God effectively, say in a church setting or even in a uh, even in a an organizational setting like Flame going on mission, you know, you need every member of that mission uh, to be wearing that armor effectively and using that armor effectively. Otherwise, there's going to be a gap and they don't need much, much of a gap before the serpent slithers through it. And that's, you know, that's part of the point. And, you know, if you if you look at where battles were won and lost, if you if your the integrity of your shield wall was broken, then the hordes poured through. And uh, so that's um, I, I think that's a really important element to it. So I think 
thinking about how we can, how in our groups, in our congregations, whatever group we think, our life groups, our home groups, how we can stir up faith in each other so that we all use the shield of faith more effectively uh, is a good thing. Thank you. And, and Roddy, of course, for mission, one of the areas that we have to do that is staying in unity as a team, because if you're not in unity, then the, field, the, shape, the shields don't interlock. Yeah. Uh, and I think <laughs> unity is such a, a key issue. Tristan, have you got, have you got a, a question from your group? Yeah, yeah, we, we have a question like, um, yeah, how, how do we practically um, apply the word of God in our lives to fight the battle? You know, are there different tools to using the word defensively and offensively? Um, do we need to recognize the lies first? A bit, a bit, a bit about that, perhaps. Yeah, I think, um, <clears throat> first of all, I mean, first and foremost, and this is the challenge for all of us, isn't it, is to know the word. Um, mm. And that takes time and practice. Um, one of the things I was very grateful for was the, the RE education I had as a boy. When I came to faith age 19, I had that repository of biblical knowledge that was immediately available for the Holy Spirit to bring to life. My wife, um, Marianne, works in an infant school um, less than a mile from our front door, where almost without, almost without exception, no child has ever heard of any of the Bible stories or any of the Bible characters. Um, and, you know, this is, a, this is part of the problem we face. And when people come to faith now, they have, don't have that foundational understanding of some of the, the stories that can um, enable us to understand the context that we are then operating in. So under, you know, learning the word is fundamentally, fundamentally important because, you know, if we don't know what it is and what it says, how can we apply it? So, so, so that's the first thing. I think that um, recognizing the schemes of the enemy, and Paul says we are not uninformed, brothers, you know, so that takes time and practice and understanding as well. We need to understand um, the nature of the enemy, that he is a liar and the father of all lies. He's deceiver of the brethren. He's the accuser of the brethren. All these aspects that the Bible highlights on who the enemy is and how he operates. It's important that we understand that. Um, and that and, and therefore we can um, understand when he is likely to um, put his oar into things. And uh, we were discussing actually that those who weren't, uh, hadn't broken out uh, were discussing just now that um, building up to a major Christian event, be that a gospel meeting, uh, be that our normal Sunday service, or be that um, the far side today, uh, you should anticipate that the enemy is going to disrupt because that's one of the things he does. Mm. And he will try and disrupt beforehand through um, all sorts of things like the car breaking down. I remember once at, our, at the, the Christian school where I was a student teacher, we were on our way to church. This is way, way back in 79. We were on our way to church in two minibuses where, where, when one of them caught fire and um, there was smoke pouring out of the engine and the headmistress um, leapt out and said, we shall exercise faith here. And she prayed over the engine and we got back in and it restarted and we drove to church. Um, <laughs> There, and that's a, you know, possibly an extreme example of, um, of an attack, but um, nonetheless, that's how she dealt with it. But mm. um, we can, over time, recognise how um, the devil it works and operates, and we should expect him to do so, because that's what he does. Um, and, you know, think, well, it's not going to affect me. I, I'm, you know, that's cloud cuckoo land, frankly, to um, the, the Satan is going to try and accuse you before God and before others, and he's going to try and deceive you and distract you and, uh, and speak to you lies. And our main defence against the lies and against the accusation is the word of God. And uh, our main weapon against um, the distractions are um, to be focused on following him. And isn't it amazing that when we decide we're going to have a time of prayer, how suddenly important it becomes to do the washing <laughs> or to post a letter or to ring auntie Flo, um, or to do the things that you wouldn't dream of doing in the normal course of events 
but suddenly something else is important and this is distraction activity and so you know um, it needs discipline and it needs focus determination that we're going to follow the laws and then you know using these weapons and you know the word is so important here now uh, that's a that's a kind of partial answer to your question uh, um, Tristan is there anything any other aspect of it that I have left untouched no, I think that's great, Roddy. Thank you. Uh, I just think also um, perhaps um, the next fireside, we, we, I think we would do go more practically into um, um, using as well. So I think it's, 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 uh, it's, there's more to come to, but thank you, Roddy. Now, I, thank you, Tristan and Roddy. I do, I'm sure that Rosemary Hearsay's group will have got a question. Rosemary, have you have you got a question? If you don't, then I better. <laughs> well, just, my... just, just very quickly. Thank you, Roddy. Wonderful talk. Lots of comments we had. But I just felt quite strongly that maybe I should ask, put one comment to you, Roddy, as a question, because I'm sure this applies to a lot of people. One person said that they never wanted to be a soldier for the Lord and realised that they needed to repent. And I was wondering if you had any other comment to add to that. In respect of, sorry, could you just, could you just, just unpack that a bit more, mm. Rosemary? Yes, um, one of our groups said that they didn't, they hadn't ever wanted to be a soldier for the Lord. Um, you know, I can't sort of explain that anymore yeah. because we didn't have time. Um, but it was the concept, I think, of not wanting to fight, mm. and they realised the need to repent. And I just felt that maybe this applied to other people. In the group and had you any comment to add add to that yes i think you know naturally <clears throat> frankly you know if you talk to any soldier who's got their head screwed on right they don't want to fight anymore either i mean it's it is not pleasant business you don't as i've said to others in the past you don't need to tell a soldier how horrible warfare is um nonetheless um it, it needs to be done and I think, I, I, frankly, we don't really have an option um, as, uh, as Christians because we are in a battle. And, you know, to ignore that fact and keep our heads down below the parapet, you know, renders us ineffective in, um, in the kingdom of God. Mm. So to be effective in the kingdom of God, we need to take our stand. And this is, you know, this is, the, this is one of the points of Ephesians 6. If we take our stand in the natural, we will be overwhelmed. If we try and stand in our own authority and our own strength, mm. we don't stand a chance. We know this. Uh, but, but God has given us those weapons so that we can stand. You know, and um, so whether one sees ourselves as a soldier I, I, you know, or not isn't the important thing. The mm -hmm. important thing is understanding the nature of the battle we're engaged in mm. and using what God has graciously given us to not only to enable us to survive and thrive in the context that we work in, but also to be victorious mm. and to bring honour to his name. Mm -hmm. And if you look at those um, conflicts in the Old Testament, there's something about um, following through and gaining the victory that brings honour to the name of Jesus, mm. on to the name of God in the in the Old Testament, in the, in our context, on to the name of Jesus, that we follow through. And so I think part of our warfare is in honouring Him, uh, and I think that's quite a helpful way of looking at mm. it. We mm. fight in order to bring glory to His name. Mm. Uh, we fight in order to uplift the name of Jesus. Part of, one of our weapons is worship. And, you know, that uh, story in uh, 2 Chronicles 20, you know, God says, I don't want, I want you to array for battle and go out into the field and take your stand, but I want you to worship. And so Jehoshaphat chooses the singers and the singers sing and they worship God. There's a great song by Don Francisco, along that, on, which um, tells the story, if you know your Don Francisco. Um, the singers sing and they they worship the god and as they worship god and as they worship the victory comes the lord does his stuff they you know the enemy ambushes themselves and so in a sense we're called to take our stand to put on our weapons to be prepared to fight but that that rule of warfare um, from deuteronomy i think is important that actually it's the lord that fights mm -hmm. you know, um, mm -hmm. and it's the lord that wins the battle 
And uh, as Val was saying in her excellent devotional, you know, God calls us onto the field um, and to be willing participants in what he's doing, but he's actually the one who's going to fight for us. Mm -hmm. So Thank I you. don't know if that's helpful. Thank you. Colin, have you got any questions from your group? We had a personal question, Roddy. I don't know if you'd be willing to answer this, but there's a question me. about, uh, did you have any secrets in how you manage your time when you're talking about that you maintain your own submission to the Lord and then praying over everything you do and doing what you do? That all is with finite time. Do you have any tips for time management? Uh, yes. Get up early. <laughs> uh, and you know it, i mean what did yongi cho he said uh, was it yongi cho who said you know uh, i try and spend half an hour with the lord every day except when i'm busy when i spend an hour mm. that's that's the sort of um upside down economy of the kingdom if you like uh, 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 why my mentor my mentor in 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 my christian life um who i met whilst i was at university um up in the northeast of england encouraged me away well, frankly he ordered me because that's kind of how he operates to get up early and and to seek god before the before the real day begins because when the day begins it begins and the days when i have not done that are the days when things all get crinkly or they go wrong and you end up at the day thinking why do i feel so out of it out of sorts why do i feel all washed up and the answer is because I have not spent time with the Lord. And you, so that's that's my answer. Is I have to personally, I have to do it first thing in the morning to study the Word and and to pray. And then, of course, praying without ceasing means being in a position, uh, in a prayerful position throughout your day, where you're communing with God, you're singing worship songs, you know, you're praying in tongues, you're praying along through the day. You're constantly in communication. And the Holy Spirit is able to you in that able in that context to minister to you and to show you things. Um, now, for others, their routine might be different. I don't know. Uh, but for each of us, I think we need to identify when is that time that you are going to devote to the Lord. And of course, the start of the day is obviously the best time. But for some, it might be lunchtime or it might be the evening. Although, frankly, for me, I'm so tired by the, the time the evening comes around, I always fall asleep over what I'm what I'm reading. So there we are. Thank you, Roddy. Thank you. And thank you, Colin. We're going, I'm going to finish now because, um, uh, and I'm sorry we haven't asked, answered everybody's questions, but, um, uh, and if you want to put them in the, uh, in the chat, you could do that and we'll see if we can follow them up at another stage. Um, uh, we, the, the other thing is, I just want to say that we will be meeting, Tristan will be speaking on the weapons of warfare. Um, on the 20th, I believe, of uh, November. Um, and our final one for this year will be on the 11th of, of December, which Val will be doing on the blood of Jesus. These are all good. These, it's important that we grasp the whole picture of fighting the battle um, and being obedient to the Lord. So I want to thank you. Uh, we will not be sending out um notes after this what we would suggest if you want to hear it we i will try and get some of the scriptures put onto uh the recording if i can do that then that makes you all you have to do is go back and listen and then you can take the scriptures down um so i want to thank everybody there was 89 people on on today we're delighted and there'll be more because there are at least 10 couples so i reckon there's a probably a hundred of us on on site today we're grateful thank you for coming to warm your hands um at the fireside again and uh, could i just pray as we leave father i just thank you for what you've been teaching us through roddy today and lord may we be able to apply it to our lives and so that we can fight the battle because we're on the victory side as long as um as long as we um seek your face we we submit to you and then we can resist the devil help us to do that in our daily lives i pray and bless people's days today today as they leave now in jesus name amen and